Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our Bishop Plus Becoming a Bishop session. My name is Stephanie Niles. I'm the Vice President for Enrollment and Communications at Ohio Wesleyan, and thrilled to have the chance to welcome you here today. We know that some of you are students who've paid your deposit already and are planning to join us in the fall. Some of you are close to making that decision and are wanting some additional information. We're here to hopefully answer all of your questions. We have had some questions that have been submitted to us in advance and we'll start with them, but I do welcome you to submit questions as well through the Q&A function. And I will take a look at those throughout the session and let our experts here on the panel um, take a stab at addressing all of your questions. I do want to point out that at uh, on the screen you see our panelists and you'll see their email addresses there. It is possible we won't get to all the questions in the hour that we have today. If we don't, please feel free to follow up with any of those individuals um, if you have questions specific to their area that they can address for you. And I'm going to ask each of our panelists to do a quick introduction, uh, introduce themselves, and to say the, the area in which they work so you know a little bit more about who's here. Kevin, why don't we start with you? Hi, I'm Kevin Passfan, Director of Financial Aid. I'm here to answer any of your financial aid questions. Thanks, Kevin. Brad? Hi, folks. Uh, my name is Brad Polsini. I use he, him, his pronouns, and I'm the Associate Dean for Student Engagement overseeing our first year programs, our orientation programs, the first year experience, um, working with first year students and their families uh, throughout that, throughout your first year, as well as club sports, marching band, community service and learning, uh, all the fun stuff that happens at OU, I get to supervise. There. Great, thanks Brad. Linda? Hi everyone, I'm Linda Hall. I use she, her, hers, uh, and I'm from Academic Affairs. I'm a professor in the psychology department, and I am also half-time as Associate Dean for Academic Performance, which is the really fun stuff. Very good, and Brian. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Brian Emmerich, Director of Residential Life here at Ohio Wesleyan, and I use he, him, his pronouns. Very good. So as I said before, don't hesitate to submit your questions, but I am going to go ahead and start with Kevin. There were several questions that came in about loans, about finances, bill paying, and Kevin's going to try and address some of those for you. Kevin, that first question asked was, how do I go about accepting my loans? Okay. So in order to accept your loans, you have to be a deposited student and you have to have an OU email account or an OU account. Once you have that, you can log into FA student, so F is in Frank, A is in Apple, student.owu.edu. You go to the accept awards page and you can go in and accept your loans. You can decline your loans or even reduce the amount if you don't want to borrow the uh, amount that's listed on your award letter. The other thing that you'll have to do too is you'll have to accept your um, federal work study if that was part of your financial aid package. Another thing to note too is if you are going to accept the student loans, you will have to complete a master promissory note and entrance counseling. This can be done at the Department of Education's website at studentaid.gov. Along the top navigation, um, it'll say complete an aid process. Then from there, you can log in using your FSA ID. That is the same ID that you use to complete your FAFSA. And again, it's the student's FSA ID and not the parents. Thanks, Kevin. Next question for you. Once I've accepted my financial aid, when will the first statement or bill be sent to me? Good one. Um, the bills are actually generated from the Bursar, um, the Bursar's office. I reached out to the Bursar um, the other day and he said he's going to generate those statements uh, July 2nd. Um, and as long as you've accepted all of your funds and have turned in all your financial aid paperwork, your financial aid will show on that initial statement when you log in. And Kevin, I think you faded out, at least for me a little bit. Did you say July 2nd was the day that Yes, July 2nd is the day that those statements will be printed. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Um, does this information, the billing information that you've discussed, does it go to students or families or both? How does that work? 
So the initial, um, I, I was talking to the bursar and what he does is when he generates the um, emails that go to the student, there's instructions on how the students log in and assign a parent so that the parent can log in and look at those statements as well. And I said, you know, when will that be sent to the parents? And they said, at the time that the statements are generated. So again, July 2nd. Thank you. Then there was a question, Kevin, as well about um, deposit. When and how is my deposit applied to my tuition? Okay, so um, if they're referring to if they made the $400 deposit and then we reduce the deposit down to $200, those credits have already apl been applied to the student's account. So when they generate statements, again, July 2nd, those $200 credits will be already on that um, bill. Right. And then just a more general question, if you are paying the $200 deposit, that actually goes directly towards orientation related costs. So we use that money, I guess you could almost say in real time to pay for the expenses associated with your, your first weeks on campus. So, um, uh, so that, that with the exception of the, those who paid the 400 and 200 of that is applied to your tuition, the 200 for everyone else goes to those orientation costs. Exactly. Kevin, let me uh, ask you one more question, at least at this point. Are there any other important dates, deadlines, or reminders that students should know about financial aid um, or about paying their bill? Any, any additional advice that you'd share with students and families? Again, statements, July 2nd. Um, the bill for the fall is uh, August 1st, uh, when that's going to be due. In the financial aid office, we send out reminders of completing master promissory notes, any missing uh, information, like every couple of weeks. So definitely stay, you know, log, you know, log into your email account. Just look for any emails that are coming from us. Check your spam bin. We've heard from some students that some of these emails are going to the spam. Sometimes they don't. I'm not sure why. But definitely check both areas to make sure. The other thing that you can do too is you can log into, again, that fastudent.ou.edu, um, log in, and there's a uh, missing information page, and you can see exactly what you're missing. Um, and each, if you have item, items out there uh, that show missing, we embed hyperlinks, and it'll take you out to uh, that specific website uh, to complete those processes as well. Um, other things to like start thinking about now is, how are you gonna pay your uh, balance after all of your financial aid has been applied? Um, we do offer payment plans, so $45 to sign up for one of those, and we can break up your payments for the semester. Um, we also have information on our website about private loans, and then also Parent PLUS loans. So if you again, you go out to our um, Ohio Westlands website and just type in student loans, we have all that information that's out there and um, all that um, can be done online as well. Kevin, where do they find out more information about payment plans? That's a helpful uh, piece of information you shared. How can they get more information on that? Um, again, if they go to the O website and just type in payment plans, it'll take them to the um, Bursars area and it goes into more information about those. There's a four month and a three month uh, payment plan. And that's per semester, correct? The four months. Correct. Yeah. Yes. Great. Thank you. That that those are the questions that were submitted on finances in advance. Again, don't hesitate to submit a question if you have um, uh, need for further insights on the financial aid or billing process. I'm going to move on to housing. Lots of questions about housing. Um, important uh, to know at this time of the year. Brian, let me ask you: How is housing assigned, and when do I find out my assignment? Yeah, so the housing application is available to students after they pay their deposit to Ohio Wesleyan and it's open until July 3rd. So uh, there's quite a bit of time between now and then to pay your deposit, get into the housing portal or our housing software and fill out your, your housing application. Uh, we then send housing assignments along with roommate contact information by July 13th. Um, we don't necessarily use a deposit date. In fact, we don't use deposit date at all to give you or a priority number for housing. So someone who deposits in January has the same chance of getting their first choice housing assignment 
as folks who deposit a little bit later. So I just wanted to make sure to share that. Great. Thanks, Brian. Um, can I choose what residence hall I want to live in? And can I choose my roommate? Um, good questions. I think um, you don't necessarily get to choose where you live, but you get to rank order your first year residence hall preferences. So um, you can order them in your application, your first choice, second choice, third choice. Um, and then we use that information to determine uh, your, your housing assignments. Uh, you're not always guaranteed your, your first choice, uh, but we do try our hardest to give students um, their, their top choice if we can. Um, our housing software uses all the information you share on your housing application to both match you with your roommates and help you find your best housing option that's available. Um, yes, you definitely get to choose your roommates if you'd like to. Uh, roommates are, are determined in one of three ways. So one, you can choose a specific person you know who is also coming to Ohio Wesleyan to be your roommate if you choose. Um, once you've completed your housing application, and your roommate or roommates have also completed their housing application, you can go into the roommate matching software um, that's included in our housing software. Um, and just like finding and matching up with a Facebook friend, you can find roommates and in, in match up in our housing software. Um, that works for folks who know people who are also coming to Ohio Wesleyan. That doesn't work for everyone, obviously. I would think the majority of you don't necessarily know somebody else who's coming to Ohio Wesleyan. Um, our, our, our application process also has a roommate finder feature. So every student can complete a roommate profile, which talks about all the things that they look for in a roommate, um, their, their, their preferences in terms of when they go to bed, when they study, how many guests they can have over, uh, whether or not you want to share all your belongings or not, etc. Um, there's a lot of different ways to answer those questions and a lot of different questions that can help you find a roommate in our housing software. Um, you can, if you've already completed your housing application, go in and start to search for roommates. Know that um, there are new roommates being added to our housing software every day as students accept their admission or enrollment here and deposit at Ohio Wesleyan uh, and gain access to the housing application and complete it. Um, they're then added to the roommate finder feature. And so know that if you didn't find your ideal roommate, um, by searching through all the available roommates, know that new ones are being added every day. Uh, and, and it's just a matter of time of finding somebody who will be a good fit. And then the third way you can get matched up with a roommate is you can allow our software to do it. Um, it takes all the information that you shared on your housing application and finds you a good match. Um, so we have a lot of students who choose to do that. Um, and it takes into account all the information you shared. Great. Thanks, Brian. One question that came in was specifically a question about athletes. Do athletes typically live together? Uh, athletes often do live together, but it's not a requirement and it's not something we residential life coordinate on behalf of an athletic team or any group of students. Student athletes who want to live together can match themselves up in the software. Um, and a lot of times um, coaches can help uh, athletes understand perhaps who else is on the lacrosse team or who else is playing volleyball um, and, and you can um, match yourself up in the roommate matching software on your own. Um, and a lot of times through athletic recruitment efforts, you'll meet other students anyways. And so a lot of students do choose to live with other athletes. But I also know quite a few students who um, are athletes who choose to live with other folks who aren't athletes. Um, and, and both of those are perfectly acceptable um, ways to find a roommate. Great. Thank you. Another question that came in was specifically about Smith Hall. Who will be assigned to live in the renovated portion of Smith Hall this year? Yeah, that's a great question. We have, um, we're, a lot of you know that we're renovating Smith Hall and we're completing the first phase of that uh, by August. Um, the second phase of that work will continue into the academic year. Um, we'll have 155 beds in Smith Hall West, which is um, roughly 35% of what our incoming class will be. So 65% of our students will live either in Welch Hall or Thompson Hall. Um, again, it, it is random and we'll randomize that through our housing software. So uh, we're not necessarily giving people who um, deposited early first choice 
um, we're going to use the software to help us figure out who's going to live in, in, in that building. Thank you. And uh, last question about residence life and um, applying for housing, at least for right now. What's the process to live in a SLU? Um, SLU life is very exciting. I think students are uh, really do appreciate it and it's popular. Um, we currently have eight SLUs. SLU stands for small living unit. Um, each is themed around something different that students are passionate about. Um, and much like a fraternity, uh, it, they recruit their own members. So as an example, we have a house called Treehouse uh, or Trouse, if you talk to our students, uh, that's what they've nicknamed it. Um, and their mission uh, is to further sustainability efforts around campus and in the community. And so all the students who live in that house have a passion for that. Um, and truly live that mission of the house. And so we have eight different SLUs with eight different missions. And um, every year those students get together and accept applications from students who want to live in, the, in, in their SLU. And they make decisions about who's going to live uh, in the SLU the following year. So um, my recommendation is if you are interested in living in a SLU, uh, again, sorry, I think I failed to mention, SLUs are available for upper class students. So first year students, aren't able to live in a SLU, but in your second year, you'll be eligible. Um, my recommendation is during your first year, you get to know people in a SLU that you have a passion area or are passionate about. So if you're interested in sustainability efforts, you know, attend Treehouse's events. Uh, go and talk to them when they're sitting on their porch. Um, knock on their door and say hello. Uh, you will get to know them through student organizations. And I think, um, make sure that they understand that you have a passion that matches theirs um, so that when it comes time to apply um, and be and, and for them to select uh, new folks into the SLU for the following year, then they know who you are and they understand that you share their passion. Brian, for individuals who've joined us today who may not have been able to travel to campus and, and mm -hmm. see and learn more about other residential communities on campus, first year and beyond, can you say a little bit more about the overall residential experience? Yeah, so um, as, trying to think of where to start. So we, we have um, a lot of different styles of living on campus. So we have more of a traditional style um, re a residence hall where you share a room with one other person and there's a community bathroom down the hallway. Uh, we have a lot of suite style residence halls where uh, amongst four individuals, you'll share a two bedroom suite and a bathroom. Um, we have um, a lot of um, suite style residence halls. Uh, we also have uh, fraternities on campus for our upper class students who are interested in living in a fraternity house with, with other chapter members and a lot of other um, houses around campus that uh, some are historic and been, have been renovated. Some of them um, are, are houses like our SLUs exist in um, where uh, upper class students can live. Um, sometimes those buildings are like single rooms or suites um, or in the instance of our fraternities, mostly uh, double rooms um, and whatnot. Um, with our, our renovations, what we're trying to do is create communities uh, for different groups of students. And so our first year students, when Smith is all done, will almost all live in Smith Hall. And so what that does is it allows us to help meet the needs of our first year students um, in very specific ways. First year students are transitioning into college and living on their own for the first time. And so our goal in creating a community like Smith Hall for them is that we can, we can help them in that transition. Um, we also, um, we, we're doing that currently um, but they're just not all in the same place. So all of our first year students live in one of three residence halls and only first year students live in those communities. So uh, we are trying to do what we can to um, meet the needs of our incoming students in their transition to college um, and, and then beyond. So we're, we're also starting to think about how we're gonna support our upper class students. We have a brand new apartment building that is breaking ground in a matter of days. Um, just had a meeting about it today and they're starting to put fencing up very soon. And so um, 
that'll be for our senior students and that'll be done in August of 2021. So just a year and a half from now. So very exciting things. We're investing roughly $60 million into our residential communities. And you're seeing the product of that here in the, the very first um, project complete uh, in August, which is Smith West. And then a couple of projects uh, finishing up the following year. Okay, I know you stopped talking. I'm sorry about the dogs barking in the background. Just nothing I can do about it at the moment. <laughs> um, Brian, question for you about the honors house. Is that for upper class students only? Good question. Yeah, we do have an honors house uh, for upper class students. Uh, that, is, that is accurate. Uh, 27 of our, our honor students um, live in there each, each semester or each year. Um, we do have an honors floor for our first year students, which is very popular. That uh, is located in Welch Hall for one more year, and then we'll move over to uh, Smith Hall once it's completely renovated. Thanks, Brian. And where is the new apartment building going to be located? Great question. Um, we have uh, roughly a five-year plan, uh, which will largely transform the, the west side of campus where our, all of our residential facilities are. Um, on the lawn of Bashford and Thompson Hall, between Bashford and Thompson and Liberty Street, uh, there's a large grassy area. Um, that will become a residence hall with a pass-through or walk-through sidewalk underneath it or through it um, so that students can continue all the way through the center of campus um, down the jaywalk uh, down Roland Avenue and right through uh, the residence hall or the, the new apartment building uh, to get to the rest of the residential side of campus. Um, it will it will be located there at the end of the jaywalk uh, between um, Liberty Street and Bashford and Thompson. Eventually, um, a few phases down in our construction plan, Bashford and Thompson um, will go away and that will become the site of a larger apartment complex. So uh, that's a few years down the road, uh, something that we're starting to plan now. Thanks, Brian. I'm going to turn to Brad, a question related to residential living, but Brad, can you talk to us a little bit about meal plan options? And a specific question that came along with that, must I stay on the meal plan for all four years? Yeah, um, so dining, we take food seriously, knowing that most of our students live on campus and I myself take food seriously too. So I like to eat on campus. So I know around all the different spots and locations. Uh, we actually provide three different levels of a meal plan and I won't go into the specifics of each here because a lot of this information, once the student deposits, uh, will get sent to them via resource guide. We'll send out and I'll talk more about that later. But we do have different tiers. The most important thing is all of our tiers have access to what is called 24 seven dining. So we make sure that we have students have access to food at all hours of the day. Our 24 seven dining location is uh, Smith, is Smith Hall dining room. So at any point of the day, a student can go down there and grab whatever they want. They want to grab a cup of coffee to go. They can, they want a omelet at two o'clock in the morning. They can go down at two o'clock in the morning and grab an omelet too. Um, we do not do, uh, we do not have dining dollars as per se as on that 24 seven plan. It's just swipe to make sure that we know that you're on the meal plan and you can come in and out as you please in our 24 hour spaces. We also have extended hours in Hamilton uh, Williams Campus Center in our what it's called marketplace, which is another buffet style type of dining hall similar to Smith, but a little smaller. And it's open from early in the morning until late in the evening for folks who come and go as they can to grab meals as well. Most of the students though, by the time the evening rolls around have transitioned back over to the residential side of campus and is eating out of Smith and not in the marketplace. There's also a sandwich place on campus called the Bishop Cafe where it's a grill style and where they can get uh, food to go and grill items to go and it's a little bit more made to order. Um, they have a dining conversion down there too on the meal plan but there are things called dining dollars that two of the plants have that you can use uh, at those places to get those to-go orders um, or a made-to-go order meal. We have a Boar's Head Deli over on the academic side of campus, um, which is doing deli sandwiches and meats over in the Science Center. So if students are over on the academic side during the day, they have access to meals as well. And then in Merrick Hall, we have a Starbucks cafe, which is important and popular as well. Um, 
for folks to get their morning espressos or Americanos or lattes. And there's grab to go grab sandwiches there as well, um, as well as other uh, grab and go same orders. Uh, students, if you're living on campus, need to be on the meal plan all four years. With the apartments, though, we're thinking about, uh, you know, just uh, once we get to that, because apartments will have kitchens in them, um, maybe adjusting the meal plan a little bit so they're not on a full meal plan. But what we'll do then is we also have a convenience store on campus currently. The convenience store would then be stocked with probably more fresh fruits and vegetables and items as well, too, as those apartments are built and come online. So folks can do some of their own cooking on campus as well. Um, we most of our residence halls have access to microwaves um, in the halls. And then we do have a kitchen in one of our facilities where students can also make meals if they want to um, in Stuyvesant Hall um, as well. So access to different food options on campus. And then our last portion is um, as part of your dining dollar program, if you are on a meal plan with dining dollars, there are seven locations downtown that offer students an opportunity to go and use their um, dining dollars in the community. A popular place is Pulp, which is a smoothie place. And if you don't know about Pulp, you will when you come to campus, because it feels like a lot of our students walk down to Pulp and get morning smoothies. Um, but places, there's a taco place, there's a Wendy's on there, there's pizza. Um, it's just a nice option for folks sometimes if you don't want to continue to eat our very good campus food, but you want a little something different to mix things up, it's a nice option. And that program is supported through our Student Government Association on campus as well. Thanks, Brad. Um, let me stick with you for a bit. Can you talk about orientation experiences? We're making some changes for the summer, obviously, in light of our, our current situation with COVID-19. Can you talk about that and then also the, the fall experience? Yeah, uh, so with summer orientation, it's, we've transitioned, as most schools are in the country, to a virtual experience, not knowing where we'll be in June with uh, COVID-19 and when we'll be able to gather again in large spaces but also knowing that um, the situation is, may have put some financial constraints on families as well too. So we didn't want to have to, students to have to come to campus in June and then have to come in August and too for a number of different reasons. So we are going to an online experience. It will be a, um, an online orientation that you take through Blackboard, which will send you all the information you need to access the course and to get that info. We're actually in the process of building it now. Uh, Dr. Hall and I have been on a number of calls in the last, week and getting that situated and up and running. Um, so we're hoping the course and will be available by June 1 to send out to folks. So students have the month of June to go through the different learning experiences within our online orientation. Um, one of the things that we are really concerned about is that you still be able to connect with others, uh, other first year students and faculty and staff through the experience. So there'll be opportunities to, to get in small groups virtually with an orientation leader to connect with an upper class, uh, upperclassmen and other new students like you were, like if you were on campus. And there's also, and I think Linda will talk a little bit about course registration later, but there will be a way to uh, interact remotely with a faculty member to register for your classes during that last week of June and to make sure that you're getting your course, courses selected for the fall as well. So it's a little different for us. We love having students on campus in the summer. So it's weird for us too not to have you all here um, because part of the reason why you're choosing Ohio Wesleyan is for that one-on-one -on -one interaction in the small school experience. But we're gonna try to translate that as much as possible to the um, online experience so you're not missing out. And then in the fall, we run a program called Camp OU, which is our six day orientation uh, for new students. Students move in on Thursday, August the 20th. And then for our non-fall athletes, uh, your fall athletes are in camps with their teams at this time. But for everyone else, you choose between four different camp experiences, um, which will give you more information so you'll know what these are. Um, but there's a service camp where you go and serve with others at locations off campus uh, and stay off campus, um, I think in a conference center. Uh, there's a wilderness camp where you go for three days and go into West Virginia and camp out and when I say camp, I mean you're in a tent and under the stars and, and um, going hiking and canoeing and all these different elements to it. There's a challenge camp, which um, is a camp with high and low rope courses, uh, a lake and other large activities that you actually stay in cabins with restrooms and air conditioning. So if you don't wanna be in the tents under the stars, 
you have an option of being cabins with air conditioning and toilets, which is always a big sell to some folks. Um, and then there's something called City Camp where we run a camp on campus for students to explore Delaware in the city of Columbus. Um, so each camp is unique in the different activities that they have, but each camp has the same learning objectives and outcomes. Um, and the camp's designed to help you ease the transition to college, introduce you to Ohio Wesleyans and our transition and traditions and expectations. Um, we have pretty um, guided conversations that help you feel like you're not the only one going through some of the questions that you have about start, starting college, that you're all in this together. Um, so it's a way of building community with folks pretty, pretty quickly. And as well as we have a Monday and Tuesday program once you get back from camp that helps you prepare for the academic rigor of the start of the school year. And we call, we internally call that Monday Academic Monday, um, but we do stuff on that day to make sure that you're ready for classes to start on, um, on the following Wednesday. So it really is a good program. We've run it, this will be the third year we've run it for all new students. Um, as most schools are running to shrinking their orientation experiences down, we've actually expanded ours out because we know the importance of this. Um, so we can go and do, do those experiences with you. If you have questions on any of that, like I said, you can email me, but I mentioned earlier, there's a new student resource guide that's being developed that will be going out electronically to deposit of students on a rolling basis on April 20th. So all this information will be included in that resource guide to include the financial aid information we've been talking about, about uh, camp, about orientation. It's really a guide to get students started at the institution. And then a lot of this information will be repeated in that summer orientation course as well too. Yes. Great, and there was, yeah. Just to go back for a quick second, there was a question that came in about meal plan. Can you buy food on campus without a meal plan? Yes. Yeah. Well, t yes. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, so cash money works. Uh, we'll take your dollars and we'll take your coins. Uh, what we find though is sometimes parents may give their child a debit card uh, on, and then we'll load in a certain amount of money for the month on a debit card for them to use as well too. We have a number of banks in the area uh, um, that you could work with. I think it's First Commonwealth. It's, we have an ATM on campus with as well too. But yes, all our locations are available to take uh, ATM and debit cards as well as cash. And just to add to that, um, the um, uh, parents can load money, additional dining dollars onto their student's account from home. So that's a really easy process uh, to, to manage and there's information about that on our website. Can you uh, mention, how, this is again a question that's just come in, how often are dining dollars used? I would say um, they're used often. Uh, students often run out of them. Um, we have two 24 hour dining halls and you can eat well um, in, in both of those locations all the time. I eat well there uh, five times a week or more. Um, and um, so I don't think there's anything wrong with those places at all, but uh, like Brad was saying, there it's sometimes nice to have variety. And those other places on campus that he mentioned, you can use your dining dollars there. Uh, students like to buy coffee, they like to have a donut, they like to um, have a sandwich that you you normally can't get in the in the uh, 24 hour or um, um, our two dining facilities. Um, and so uh, I would say students often run out and um, want more. Um, and so uh, yeah, it's it's very popular. Yeah, I don't think I don't think there's lack of options in the all you can eat dining. So we do provide that basic level for folks to make sure that they have an affordable option and have access to food 24 seven. Um, they do make fresh donuts in Hamwell every morning, which is Hamwell short for Hamilton Williams Campus Center. Um, so I really think it's just to the extent of you can always change the meal plan you're on to and make adjustments to it. So if you find that you're needing to be on the basic one and just add some dining dollars for the semester to get through and then adjust up or down depending on where you're, how you're using it, you can also always make an adjustment as well. So Brad, if a student is having trouble deciding which meal plan is best for them, do you have a recommendation or is there a resource that you'd point them towards? Yeah, we have a dining website. I mean, it's um, AVI has our uh, has all our information on our websites through the dining services. If you search, just type dining services, it will navigate you to their site and their pl meal plan levels. I always tell first year students, if you can, maybe, I think most students get put on this 
silver the middle plan anyway as a baseline and then see how you're utilizing it and then adjust up or down depending on utilization the last thing we've done the what we want to do is make sure you have access to food all the time and we've done that with the basic level plan but it might be good to have that um is uh and brian's correcting me that it's gold's the middle plan i'm forgetting our levels of, of the olympics uh here um but gold's our middle plan so I, we put everybody i think on that middle but then to be able to adjust up and down depending on need great thank you linda i'm going to turn to you a series of questions about academics first one is how will i register for my fall courses and when does that occur um uh, Brad mentioned earlier our online orientation course. A large component of that course will be about academics to introduce you to the requirements for graduation so that you have some context for selecting courses. We will also have within that course uh, a long, long, long list of potential courses you could take with descriptions so you could spend some time looking at that. And that will be preparation for uh, registering for fall classes. And we'll do the actual registration the week of June 22nd. So we will have individual appointments. We will try to match each student with a faculty registration guide who knows about their area of interest. Uh, that person will spend some time reading their admission application as well as other materials you provide to us within the context of this course. Uh, and we will try to have a talk with you and try to put you in, in classes at that time. So Linda, you've touched on this a bit, but a student asks, I'm not sure how to choose my classes. Is there someone specifically that can help me? Yes. The faculty who do this have done this for years, so they know a lot about course requirements. Um, I, I think maybe it, it might be helpful to say that generally, uh, as a liberal arts institution, uh, we have requirements for almost everyone where we want you to sample uh, courses across the, the uh, campus, across the curriculum. And so we will encourage you to take a variety of courses your first year. Uh, and we will also encourage you to start exploring courses that could potentially lead you to a major. But the nice thing is you don't have to know your major coming in. And I think one of the best things you could do is come with an open mind, come with uh, some excitement and interest about exploring, uh, and we'll try to get you on track uh, to explore with appropriate course sections so we don't start you in an advanced class for your first year. You, you actually were reading the mind of the questioner in this, uh, this next question, which is, when do I have to choose a major? Um, if I am ready to declare, or I think I'm ready to declare my first year, can I do that? Students may declare at any time. We have a form on, on the website, and as soon as, I think as soon as you're deposited, that should be ac accessible. That it's actually on the registrar's website. However, I, there's no reason to rush. There's no advantage to it, so I don't encourage you to, to rush into that. Um, and you don't have to declare until the end of your sophomore year. Uh, we do find that a fairly high percentage of students come certain they know their major, and then they try something new <laughs> and change their mind. And, and if that happens and they've already declared, they can change their declaration. So you're not committed until it gets close to graduation. And at that point in time, you have to have completed the requirements of, of at least one major. Uh, but still, there's, there's no advantage to declaring early. Uh, if you have expressed an interest, we'll do our best to get you in the first level courses for that major, uh, regardless of whether you've uh, declared or not. Linda, you mentioned that faculty members are great advisors, but how are advisors specifically assigned to each student? One distinction I'll make um, is that during the course registration process in June, you will not be working with your academic advisor. And the reason is that many of our faculty are gone in the summer. They're engaged in research all over the country and, and beyond. Uh, and so the person who might be the best advisor for you to begin with may not be here. Uh, but we have faculty registration guides who know the curriculum very well and can help you get started. Um, after you've been here and after we've learned, well, after you've gone through the orientation, I should say, I'm referring to what we did in the past, but this year, after we've uh, worked with you, we've registered you, we know a little bit more about you, uh, then we'll have a process in July where we will assign you to an academic advisor, and that will be someone to help you get started. Uh, but students have the opportunity to choose who their academic advisor will be. And, and so after students are on campus, if you take a class with someone and you really feel a nice connection with that person, you see common interests, 
Uh, that person might have a research you're interested in. Uh, that person might talk about internship possibilities that you're really interested in pursuing. Uh, you can ask that person to be your advisor. Uh, and, and most of the time, students will switch that way. Most departments strongly urge students to have an advisor within their major department. Uh, so I, as personally, uh, I'm in the psychology department. I have advised uh, students in chemistry. I, I advised one student in art. I've advised students in business. And I can tell them how to get to graduation, but I can't tell them quite as well about internship opportunities, for example about how to best prepare for graduate school, for another example. I know my discipline very well, but I don't know other disciplines quite so well. So we strongly encourage students to find someone else they'd like to work with within their major department. But uh, if, if they want to keep working with me, I'll keep working with them. And so that's kind of how the system works. Some students change their advisors more than once. They find that different individuals serve them better at different points in their undergraduate career. And that's certainly something you can do. Thanks, Linda. Can you say a little bit about general education requirements? What does that look like? What are what is required of students? Um, can are you able to give a percentage of courses that say a student takes in general education versus their major versus other areas of study? No. <laughs> and the reason I cannot is that unlike some other institutions, we permit students to have one course count in more than one way. It might count as a distribution credit and a writing course and a course toward their major. And so how many courses will depend on the student and, and the selections that the individual student makes. Having said that, students are required to earn 34 units of graduate credit to graduate. We do not use semester hours, we use units. And typically a unit is one semester long class. We do have some classes that are half a unit. We have some that are a quarter of a unit. Um, some of the courses that have a lab, like our natural science labs, will be one and a quarter unit. Uh, so students take typically about 34 courses. Of those 34 courses, 10 of them will be distribution credits, full unit distribution credits. Uh, so three will be in the social sciences, three will be in the natural sciences or math or computer science or data analytics, three will be in the humanities or literature, and one will be in the arts. So that's the 10 distribution of requirements. We also have competence requirements, and these are ones that are very likely to overlap with some of the distribution requirements. So students either have to take or be exempted from uh, an English composition course. And students might be exempted from that uh, if they have taken a college class elsewhere. Some students bring that in, uh, but also based on some test scores. Uh, if your ACT in reading is a 37 or above, for example, that's the one I know off the top of my head and I don't remember the others. So an English comprehension course. Uh, and then to continue to develop writing skills, students have to take three writing intensive courses before they graduate. Most typically students will do one of those sophomore year, one junior and one senior year. Um, they have to demonstrate competency in a foreign language. Uh, and some of that means some students will take two semesters to demonstrate competency. Some students will come with a strong background and will start in that second level class and then they only have to take one semester. Some students are exempt and we will do some placement testing to determine what the appropriate level is for a language. We have a lot of languages also. So some students who have a strong background in one language from high school choose to start over and study a new language once they arrive here. Uh, and then students also have to have a course that uh, is emphasizing cultural diversity and a course that, that emphasizes quantitative reasoning. So I lost track there. I think there's six, four, five, six, eight courses plus the 10. So you've got 18 courses total if you take as a different course for each of those requirements, but it's very rare for students to take a different course for each of those requirements. Very often, of course, will count for more than one one requirement. Great. And a participant is asking about how many classes do students take each semester? Um, a typical full time load is four and one quarter unit class uh, credits. So if you want to earn 34 credits in eight semesters, you need four and a quarter. Um, to be full time, you have to have three and a quarter. Uh, we usually try to start our first year students in four and a quarter, and that quarter credit will come that first semester in our first year course. Uh, it's called UC 160, the OBU experience. 
That one uh, meets less often and has uh, fewer academic demands, which is why it's only a quarter unit instead of a full unit course. But it's a course to introduce you to the liberal arts, uh, to our curriculum specifically, to the OWU Connection, our signature program, and all the opportunities and support services we have on campus. So the course is, is to help students explore in a small group with lots of discussion with the instructor uh, what kinds of opportunities are here. One of the key elements of that course that we're kind of proud of is that we have students develop a four-year plan. And so they decide what courses they might take each semester across the four years. Now, it is not the case that you have to know your first semester what classes you're taking spring semester your senior year. That's not really the point of the activity. The point of the activity is to make sure you are aware of the tools we have for tracking the credits, our course catalog that tells you the requirements for majors and for uh, general education, et cetera, and, and tells you how to plan. And so that first plan is just so that you get some practice and then you can go off and take a plan that's going to be uh, more likely what you will actually do. And you'll probably revise it several times and that's okay too. That's, that's exactly what we want you to do is to explore and revise, but be thinking ahead, especially so that you can work in the extra opportunities you might want to do. Some of our students want to study abroad for a semester. Uh, some of our students, students want to be captain of a varsity athletic team. Uh, and that's a wonderful thing to do, but if you are going to be captain of that varsity athletic team, you might want to make sure that you aren't taking your most demanding academic courses that particular semester. So we want students to start thinking about the curriculum and the co-curriculum and the things they want to accomplish and how to have balance in their four years as they do that. Thank you, Linda. This is a question either for you, Brad, or, or you, Brian. Um, could we possibly get a little bit more information on what Greek life is like for first year students? Yeah, definitely. Um, so we have what's called deferred recruitment at Ohio Wesleyan University that students have to have an established OWU GPA before being able to go through recruitment um, in our Greek system, uh, which means that you get to come to campus, see what it's all about, uh, have interactions with each of the organizations, they all hold, hold events. And then in the spring semester, go through the uh, recruitment process if that is something you want to do. All of the Greek community events uh, that are put on throughout the semesters or throughout the year are open to the OU community. It's not just open to Greek members. So it's a good way of getting to know the different members of the different organizations. And if being a member of a fraternity story is right for you. There will also be information sessions that are held by our Greek councils in the fall semester for new students. And I'm sure even there's going to be information on open forums this summer, most likely, for folks that are interested in exploring what Greek life means as part of our summer orientation experiences and open forums we're holding as well, too, to get more information on that. So it's a vibrant part of our community. About 40% of our population is involved in Greek life on campus. Um, but I say that in that uh, since we're a small school, a lot of students are just not Greek or not just athletes. It's usually I'm Greek and an athlete or I'm Greek and in treehouse or I'm in treehouse and on the varsity lacrosse team. Um, so there, there's ways of interacting with members of our different communities just, just because of being a smaller school and having those opportunities. Uh, but there's five national sororities on campus and five national fr uh, fraternities on campus as well. And we also have uh, MPHC groups on campus which are our historically back black uh, fraternities and sororities as well too. Thanks, Brad. I'll take this next one. Um, will there be any, potentially be any changes to the start date of the semester due to the COVID situation? Um, the answer is potentially. Um, we all know about as much as we all know at this particular point in time. Um, we are actively planning, as I think you've heard my colleagues say, for you to be on campus this fall. And while there are some changes that you heard related to orientation and, and some of the summer experience, um, we are actively planning for your return. We do recognize, for example, that we may have um, international students who can't get here. And so there may be, um, uh, there certainly are plans in place for and being developed to attend to their educational experience for the fall. Um, we are looking at every scenario that we can determine at this point. You will know about as soon as we do um, if we are in a situation where we can't welcome students to campus 
And um, again, we are right now actively planning if that would have to occur, what would that look like and what would the impact on our students be? Um, but again, we are very hopeful that we will be in a position to have classes start as we would all expect in late August um, this year. Let me turn to another question. Um, again, Brad or Brian, is alcohol allowed on campus? How much partying goes on at the school? Um, good question. So uh, alcohol is allowed on campus, but uh, just like everywhere else, you have to be 21 uh, to have alcohol on campus. Um, does that mean that people who aren't 21 have alcohol on campus? Probably. Um, but what we really try to do is teach um, everyone if they're going to choose to drink, how to do that responsibly. So uh, we have some programs in place that all of our first year students go through um, to, to help them learn how to do that if that's something they're, they're going to choose to do while in college. Uh, but again, in order to have, uh, without breaking a policy uh, or the law, uh, to have alcohol on campus, uh, you have to be 21 years old or older. Um, is there a lot of partying on campus? Um, you know, uh, may, Brad may want to chime in on this as well, but in my opinion, no. Um, I think that um, in comparison to other universities, um, there, there isn't a lot of partying on campus. Uh, does that mean that it doesn't happen? Uh, no, it, it definitely does on occasion happen, but I think for the most part, it's, it's relatively calm uh, here. Yeah, and I, I'll reiterate that we, we promote healthy consumption as much as we can. Uh, of course, we follow state and federal rules around alcohol and possession of alcohol, um, but we also wanna make sure students, as they're choosing to um, consume, that they're doing it in a responsible way that will translate to the responsible ways of consuming for the rest of their life as well too. So we also allow for events to happen on campus with alcohol if they register with the Student Involvement Office and Public Safety. We don't have a ton of events that happen in that way, but another part of this is um, teaching students how to responsibly host and giving, them the, and giving them the ways to do it safely and having a bartender and making sure that nobody's over consuming and there's legal age a lot too. Um, I always like to flip the question too is, um, there's also a lot of stuff to do that doesn't involve alcohol on campus. Um, you're gonna find something to do almost every day of the week, whether that be a lecture that's happening through an academic department or an organization meeting that you're in, or a Bible study through our chaplaincy or something that's being put on by our campus programming board. There's options on campus for folks to do things outside of just maybe um, going to a, a campus party if that's a, a, even an option. Uh, our campus programming board puts on a number of signature events throughout the year that students love. Uh, one that we, we wish we could be holding in two weeks, which is Day on the J, which is a, or an event where the whole campus comes together and for lunch and a picnic style, and we have inflatables and artists and events out and happening. Uh, that happens twice a year. We have Acapalooza in the spring. We have Bishop Bash, which we had to cancel for this year, but I think the performer may be coming in the fall. Um, that is usually a national act that comes to campus as well too. Um, in the past, we've had bands and comedians come to campus. So there is something to do almost every day of the week that doesn't involve uh, consumption. Um, even Res Life does a late night at Smith program where they do late night programming. It's great. You can eat some food and have some fun at like midnight. Who would have thought? I'm sleeping, but you may be up and ready to go. Um, but we also know college students operate on different schedules as we do. So we provide an entertainment opportunity throughout the evening and different times and nights too. Thanks, Brad. So we just have five minutes left. We've reached the end of the questions that have been submitted. I will give folks who are participating a couple of minutes to submit their last questions. Let me ask the panelists though, you all participants have submitted some great questions. My guess though is folks uh, here at Ohio Wesleyan, you have heard additional questions from enrolling students that weren't asked here today. Is there are one or two questions and your quick answers that you wanna be sure to convey to those participants, make sure they know before they walk away from this session? Yeah, I mean, I'll jump quickly. And we always talk about involvement because I'm the involvement guy on, on campus. Um, I think it's okay not to get overly involved right away. Students always think about like, I, I, I'm so excited, I'll enjoy all these clubs. But I think it's okay to 
do one thing and do it well, or do try two things out and do it well in the first year and not overwhelm yourself as you're tra transitioning to academic life and being away from school, from home for the first time. Um, college classes are much different from high school classes in the way that the, the rigor is and the work that may need to be translated to completion. So there's a lot of transitions happening. We wanna make sure you find communities are engaged, but we throw the student involvement fair at you in the first, first part of the year where you get to sign up for all of these organizations if you want to and be engaged but really try to find that one thing that, or two things that you might want to be involved with and just roll with that. You can always switch and switch out. But I think sometimes we think that because we're coming from high school where we have to be involved in all these things in order to make ourselves look good for missions, applications and for th and things and we're, we gather all these credentials. We're trying to get you to focus on doing something very well and thinking about intentional engagement and involvement and finding your niche and finding your path and career and, uh, through just academics, engagement and career exploration as well too. I'd like to build on that from what, what Brad said. Um, am I on? I am on, okay. Uh, and, and that's that we see more and more students who seem to think they need three majors and two minors. And no, you do not. Um, and I think there is a lot to be said to pursuing one thing in depth, that that really helps you get higher level skills that will make you more competitive for whatever you wanna do once you leave Ohio Wesleyan. So, um, I, 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 and again, that's part of the reason why there's no reason to rush in choosing your major. Take your time and find the one that's right. Uh, we tell students that part of what they need to do is transition from a culture in which they were pushed to collect credentials, to have a list, I did this and this and this and this and this, to a situation when you graduate, when you're going to have a story to tell. And you're going to be able to say, I did this, and this is what I learned, and this is what I've gained from it, and this is what makes me a good fit for the job or the grad school position or whatever it, uh, it is that you want to do next. And you don't get that from jumping from one thing to the next, to the next, to the next. You get that from really investing deeply in the things that you do. Thank you, Linda. Brad, your comments did spark another question. If there is not a particular club on campus, can someone start a new one? Yes, um, we have news clubs starting all the time. I think we have about three or four each semester that get approved to be new clubs. Um, one of my favorite most recently is SOC, which is service through crocheting and knitting is a club on campus now, which is awesome. <laughs> um, so yes. You can start a club if we don't have it on campus. You would work with our student involvement office on that process. There's a new club application that happens every semester. Uh, I think you have to find 10 other students to, to form the club and go through the process of um, writing all the documents we need to get you going. But our student government will help fund that club up to $200 to get started. And then the club is eligible for student government funding out of the student activity fee moving forward every semester after that. So we've we've had our fair share of unique clubs we had a beekeeping club just recently on as well too so i mean if you could dream it we can achieve it for the best part thanks brad kevin since i already asked you a sort of summary question about important dates deadlines and reminders i'm going to give brian the last word here in our last 30 seconds to one minute um just to share anything that i feel anything that you feel that would be helpful for these folks to know. You know, um, one of the things I, I kept thinking of as Brad and as Brad and Linda are are uh, we're, we're sharing is that a lot of students and parents ask about safety and student safety on campus. I think um, one of the things that um, I focus on a lot is is student safety oriented, and and we work in strong collaboration with our public safety office uh, to make sure that we're offering safe communities for our students to live in. Uh, we have student leaders called RAs, resident advisors, who live on every floor, who are trained in emergency response, um, who can help students with uh, lockouts if they get locked out of their room, uh, who have a roommate conflict or have something happen that they just need some assistance with. And, and it doesn't always have to be an emergency, but it can be a crisis or something that has impacted a student in a way that, that they need some support. And so. Um, we have professionals who work in our department, um, who have master's degrees that live on campus and provide 365 days of 24 seven coverage along with our public safety office to try to, to help students in the times that they need 
help oh, strong collaborations with our counseling center, strong collaborations with our academic re support resources. And so uh, we take that role very seriously and it's something that we focus on when we train all of our student staff and, and professional staff. Great, thank you very much. And we are right at five o'clock. So I'm gonna thank the panelists for joining us today. Thank participants for being with us as well. We hope we will able to answer many of your questions. Again, note the email addresses of the panelists here. If you have a follow-up question you wanna ask them, please don't hesitate to reach out. Don't forget to look at the rest of the Bishop Plus information sessions. There's another eight or nine of them coming throughout the duration of April and likely more to come in May. So we hope to see you back online here again soon. Thanks again. <laughs>